So good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to you all. So my name is Caroline Monaghan, and I manage the Radley and Society based here at like, Radley College. I'm currently broadcasting live from the top of Mansion, bringing you our first ever virtual archives event, focused on 1940s Radley. We're pleased to have our archivist, Claire Sargent, here to talk you through the decade, but we really want this to be an interactive session, so please feel free to share your memories as we go. Now, just a few housekeeping items before we begin so that the event runs smoothly. Could you please keep your microphones on mute as much as possible, just to avoid any background no uh, noise disturbance. If you want to ask a question of Claire, then please raise your hand like this, just like in school, and I will interrupt Claire at the right point and invite you to unmute yourself and ask your question. There's also a chat function, for those of you who don't know, at the bottom of Zoom, so you can type something in there. I will keep an eye on that. And again, at the right time, I'll find the point to ask your question of Claire. Um, I also need to let you know that this event will be recorded for use on our website so that we can share this with those that were unable to attend who wanted to. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Claire Sargent, our archivist. Claire has worked at Radley for 25 years and as well as being our archivist is also a classics don. She's therefore in a prime position to talk about the Radley of 1940s, but also about Radley as it stands today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Claire. Hello, welcome to everybody. Um, this is my first time that we've done this, so we're really experimenting how we, how we manage it. And what I've done is that I've selected a number of items and images, and I hope that they'll just encourage conversation. Uh, I really, really want this to be interactive, so it'd be very good if people could just put their hand up, unmute themselves, chip in and talk about stuff. All I'm doing is, is presenting some material to promote the conversation. And I'm going to start with introducing you to some material that we've just received. It was actually a gift, a recent gift, so I'm going to share my screen. And... Hopefully, we'll go with the very first of these. This is silent, and I will return to it a little later on. But just for the moment, just a taster of 1940s Radley. <clears throat> we'll come back to that a little later on so you can follow it but I'm sure a lot of you will recognize what the event is. Uh, this particular piece of film uh, was found in an attic by the Abingdon Archaeological and Historical Society. It was the dentist from Abingdon who had made this actual piece of cine film for us, uh, for, for himself, and it had got lost in a, in a cupboard. They found it a couple of years ago, digitized it and sent a copy to us. So it's a very, very much a piece of amateur film. But what it also, what it went with, ah, Just working on the next screen. 1940s Radley. I'm sure you recognize quite a lot of the people in this photograph from the prefects of 1940, which is where I thought we'd start. And this kind of film is very much available. Uh, the, the photographs like this are now available on our website. Now we sent you a link recently to the digital archive. This is what it looks like. I'm going to go live to it, which is always a mistake in the middle of a Zoom meeting, but we're going to try. And the next latest addition to that is this set of audio recordings. And this, I'm sure, again, you will remember. Thank you. 
Claire, um, I can't hear that. Do you mind just going back and um, putting on a bit louder for us, please? I don't, unfortunately, I didn't bring with me the, um, the, the, the program, which would say who that was, but I'm sure very many people remember it. But yeah, also, not, Claire, sorry to interrupt, I'm not sure if people heard. Can people just sort of let me know if they have heard that? Can they hear it? No, I think we probably need to play it again just so that we can hear. And I don't know if you can switch your volume up a little bit, please, Claire. My volume is on full, but I'm working through the microphone. If I take the microphone off, that might help. Okay, yeah, that would be good because I think a few people didn't catch it. Okay, let's let's try it without the microphone. Uh, I think we're going to go to the screen share and try and get another option to share the audio. So stop the screen share. Stop the share. Yeah. Okay, and then this, this is the wonder of live screen. events, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And share audio. Oh, so click on it. So click there. And then click on share computer sound. Ah, uh, share there the computer are. sound. Yeah. That should work. Brilliant. Thank you, Henry. Okay, so with a little technical help there, we'll come back to that one. Um, we'll move here and see if this can be heard. Eximis praecordis, like Thomas Radley and says, quod in his nostris feris saecularibus, regiam celsitudinem tuam, patronam et fautricem nobis et hibere contigerit, equidenim post centum annos in literis et ludes felicta actos, et gaudium nostrum et spem magis cumulari posset, Quamut illa principissa, juvencula inter adolescentes ad esse dignata. Quae gratia lepores facilitate sua, omnem ubique bretanorum pro sapiem, iam dudum amore de vincit. Dum pro hoc delecto collegio nostro, fausta omnia et prospera praesargimus, liciat felicitatem Tuam sempiternam ex animo deum precema. Liciat nostrem ergate familiam qui tuam insignissimam testema fidelitatem. Liciat te intramuros nostros adio amabilita venientem salvere ubeamus. I played that piece to. Uh, a couple of the boys the other day and the whole idea of a senior prefect giving an entire speech in Latin to which the entire school listened to just blew their minds. Played it to somebody from outside of the school and I'm afraid that it, it just reinforced their view of, of quite how much we're like Harry Potter and whether we're actually Hogwarts and quite how much uh, magic was going on there. So how much times have changed with that? But we should be able now to hear the reply. I thank you, senior prefect for your kind and generous words of welcome. I am so very glad 
to have been able to come to Radley today and to join with you in this wonderful service of thanksgiving. The celebration of a centenary is always an occasion for rejoicing, particularly in the life of a great school. For while it grows older, it remains ever young and is always being renewed with fresh blood and the vitality of youth. During the few happy hours which I have been able to spend among you, my thoughts have turned to the many changes which Radley must have seen in the last hundred years. Your numbers have increased, fine new buildings have sprung up, and the friendly vigor of school life is molded to the pattern of modern conditions. Much too has remained as it has always been. The beauty of your surroundings, your code of honor, your good repute, and the firm understanding of religious values in which the foundation of this school was enshrined. In spite of the calamities of war, in spite of the dangerous challenges to all the things we believe to be best, Radley has emerged a finer place than it has ever been. With pride you may look back upon the past. With gratitude and joy you can celebrate the centenary. And with hope, confidence and resolve you may step into the future. In 1947, uh, the Princess Elizabeth was 19, and this was one of her very earliest public engagements, and one of the um, one of the earlier of her public speeches. We are, of course, now moving into the 170, uh, planning for our 175th anniversary, so 75 years on, and we uh, we question uh, whether we still hold those uh, those founding principles, those challenges. How much has changed? Claire, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you a minute? We have a couple of questions, I think. Yep. Now, I think uh, Peter was first. Peter Peter with the glasses, I'm afraid that's how I'm going to have to describe you because I don't have your surname. Um, and then um, David after yep. that. So Peter, if you'd like to unmute yourself, fantastic. Thank you, Claire. Peter Fulton, 1943. Hello. Uh, Claire, I remember that event so well, the visit. Mm of Princess Elizabeth. She delivered that speech so beautifully, age 19. It was a well-scripted speech, but she delivered it with a huge amount of charm, and it was she was just so popular. I remember after that, she was taken away by the prefects to pup study, fed her, I think, a very good tea, and did a tour of the college. That's excellent. To, to actually to get the response to, to how that speech went down is, is a really exciting thing for us, I think. Because uh, as I say, we've, we've only been able to hear it uh, within the last um, uh, couple, of, uh, couple of months that we've actually been able to digitize this recording. So absolutely brilliant. We'll talk about the prefect's tea in a few moments. There was another question. Well, it's David Craig. Just to say, I was at that tea, but if you're going to talk about it, maybe I'll wait till you've done so. <laughs> well, no, talk about it, David. I, I'm going to come out of this screen and uh, move on to the next one that I have, um, if I can. Just there. May then be something that you recognise? Uh, well, I don't personally recognise, but I did see it the other day on your screen. And I was at the tea, and I, I mean, we got things to eat, which in uh, a time of uh, rationing was beyond belief, including meringues. And I offered her, uh, the Queen, or then Princess Elizabeth, a meringue, but she had one look at them and said, they're the puffy out sort, so I don't think I'll have one. Right. <laughs> Yes, well, a meringue would be quite a challenge to make, wouldn't it? Because you've got the sugar rationing, you've got a shortage of eggs still in 1947. Is that the case? No. So, she, so how she, how the cooks manage that is quite quite a thought. Mm -hmm. Somebody did write to me um, over the last couple of days, remembering 
um, fagging. And he was remembering uh, fagging, I think he was Wheeler Bennett's fag. And uh, very, very keen on scrambled egg on toast. So he was explaining being down in, in what appeared to be the boiler room, which I can't quite believe, um, with a slice of bread on a toasting fork, making toast, and then making scrambled egg with powdered eggs. And regarding this as a great delicacy, and this, this was his memory of that. So the rationing is, is quite something. So th this I found just in the file for things of a time of Vaughan Wilkes. And it is indeed the actual receipt for the box of chocolates. So 18 shillings and eightpence, was that a whip round among the prefects or did the school pay? I don't remember paying, I doubt if I could. <laughs> I thought it was quite a large amount. Yeah. Your story, um, I don't want to delay the system, but okay, the story about eggs reminds me there was a farm just by the school where you could get fresh eggs. And I can remember, of course, trying to make scrambled egg with fried egg, but I had a real egg. And when I put it in the saucepan, I had failed to clean the saucepan from the previous fried egg user. <sighs> so my egg ended up with lots of black spots in it. Mm. And inedible. Anyway, that's enough on that. <laughs> the only thing to remind everybody that her mad the Princess Elizabeth had just got back from the Tower of Africa with her father and mother, and which it said, as long as I live, however short or long my life is, I shall be serving the country. Mm. Yes, that was the speech that she'd just made, wasn't it? And I, I must say, I felt uh, the most moving image of this week was the picture of her just standing in Westminster Abbey next to the tomb of the unknown warrior, I thought. So if we move on, this is a nightmare. And obviously it's something that we've had as a little bit of a nightmare at the moment because we've just done a term of, uh, virtual teaching with boys all around the world logging on uh, via Teams for their lessons. We've now, we've got some boys who are still being taught remotely from uh, classrooms and so on. And so trying to manage our timetable at the moment is a real headache. Uh, but this one, the 1943 timetable when Eastbourne were here, uh, I can imagine again, this was something that was I mean, do, do you remember between you all how this worked? Did it work as smoothly as it looks at, like the, those 10 minutes where Eastbourne could get into breakfast before Radley arrived? Uh, and then uh, again, they've got sort of 10 minutes of dinner before Radley start, uh, before Radley start their lunch and so on. And just trying to squeeze the two schools in together. Do people remember the difficulties of, of doing that? Is anybody coming back to us, Carol? Peter, Peter, um, Peter, did you, you, you feel free to go ahead? Yes, I remember it well. The Eastbourne were given two of the socials. I think they were given what was Cox's social and what was um, the Peyton social. Mm. And uh, yes, it, it was quite difficult. I and mean, the school was extremely crowded and eating. Eastbourne used to eat in the barn while Radley ate in the hall. Uh, we got on moderately well with Eastbourne. We, they were, we were great rivals. And we used to refer to Eastbourne School as the Bogs. I don't know whether any of them would remember that, but that was the nickname which we gave them. We, we did consider whether we should invite Eastbourne uh, to join, uh, not quite sure, well, whether, whether, whether we should invite Eastbourne to join in on this, uh, on this talk, but we weren't able to get hold of anybody. I did receive uh, an email uh, talking about tribalism and his first experience of tribalism was having Eastbourne here 
So here's the Eastbourne v Radley rugby match of 1940. I believe Peter Way played in that. I'm pretty sure that he's told me about this. I love the way that it made it into the Times uh, with a Radley win. And here we've got some very familiar signatures for the team at the time. I do have the team photograph as well. We'll go back to uh, photographs in a minute. This match in 1940 is, is described as a win by, um, by the Times. We do have the record of the match also. I think it's either 42 or 43, which again uh, was reported and was really hard fought. We can imagine uh, both schools on the touchlines cheering both their teams on because they're both playing at home. Uh, but I do know that uh, one of these fixtures uh, was won at the time by Eastbourne, but it's by a very, very tight margin. And I know when I looked into the history of uh, rugby at Radley a couple of years back for the rugby centenary, uh, we did realize that under the new scoring system, if we'd played by contemporary scoring, Radley won that match, this is that close. So again, uh, sport, we've got these fabulous shorts. <laughs> we do have what appear to be um, Eastbourne, I guess, are the ones in the check. And looking at it, they appear, is this a helmet or is he actually playing in his cap? Surely you can't play rugby in a cap. Would anybody like to come back to me on that as a, as a question? Anybody remember playing in the match? Uh, Penelope. Sorry, I've only got the name Penelope there. Would you like to come back on that? You're on mute at the moment, Penelope. If you just take yourself off mute, that's perfect. Yeah. Sorry, I'm Michael Carlton Smith's wife. We haven't got the picture. We can't see the picture. What picture? At the rugby should, game. There should be a screen sharing going on. Can everybody else see that screen? Stop and come in again. Does that help? Penelope, could you unmute? Uh, yes, we can see the picture. Thank you very much. Can you see the picture now. Could you see the previous ones? No. Go the wrong way. Oh, it's Monty. No, no, we, we'll, come, we'll come back to Monty. Um, just, <laughs> okay. Fine. Uh, I'll, this is, I'll, this I'll just mute go. myself again. I'll mute myself. No, no. We'll just come back. So this was the timetable. Did people see that? And the um, the receipt for chocolates. So there's the match. And Monty, Montgomery of Alamein, coming to speak to the school. Again, all of this is in 1947, the, uh, this one. As far as we're aware, this blackboard on which he described the Battle of El Alamein uh, is now in the Imperial War Museum. At least this was a report that we received a couple of years back. But I'm pretty sure that he must have given the same talk to several schools. So whether it's actually our blackboard, which is there, I don't know. What I also liked was this, this, this lineup of dons along the front, all on chairs, which makes me wonder whether the boys behind them can actually see through them to see what he's talking about there on the terrace of the mansion. And some fabulous, fabulous cadet haircuts, very much of the 1940s, you can see these going on. Do come back if there's anything anybody wants to talk about or remembers. Well, just to say, yes, I was there too. Right. I can remember it well, fun enough. Um, over the years, one got to hear how 
he had won El Alamein time and time again. So <laughs> I'm sure we weren't the only ones who ever heard him tell us how he'd won the battle. And of course he'd inspected the, uh, the cadet force, or whatever we called ourselves in those days, before. So yes. Some of us probably are in uniform, cadet uniform. Yes, those are the JTC, where it would have been the joint, uh, I'm not sure what J JTC stood for, it was, it's easy, yeah. Michael, um, I've seen you want to ask a question as well, Claire. Michael yeah. just would like to ask a question in a moment too, please. Yep. Yeah. Is that me? Yeah. Uh, am, I, am I live? We yes. can hear you, thank you. Yes. Yes, hello. Well, actually one or two comments on that. You mentioned the haircuts. Actually, it was the Corps who had the short hair, and we all had to queue up before the inspection at the tuck shop. And the chap who commanded the Corps, which incidentally was called in those days, it wasn't called the JDC, it was called the Corps. Right. Um, the, the chap who commanded, I think his name was Major Way, come to think of it. And Major Way stood there with a horse cl hair clip, a horse clipper. And he just clipped round the sides and the backs of our heads. So that's why we look so smart. <laughs> but it was a very memorable day. The other memorable thing about that day was that um, it was a very hot summer's day. And um, we got on parade, of course, very early. And quite a number of boys started fainting. So mm. it was considerably produced, reduced parade by the time the famous field marshal arrived in front of us. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. yes, we do have the, uh, we still have the photograph of him uh, inspecting the parade. And we've um, certainly got the uh, photograph of him signing the drum. And I know that our, our current uh, CCF are very ha unhappy that they don't have the drum any longer. They would have loved to be able to use that still. This I uh, picked out because I recently answered an inquiry uh, from uh, an old Radleyan whose father was a prisoner of war. Um, it wasn't actually uh, D.L. Edmonds, but I picked them out because we, we use this to show, um, because boys and so on were, were complaining just a little bit about contemporary lockdown. Uh, and so I, I sent them a copy of one of the prisoner of war letters that we'd had, which, which said, you know, it's taken 44 days for a parcel to arrive. Um, and we're hoping that the weather is going to change. And I kind of felt that, that lockdown, if you're there with your family and your pet dog and a fridge full of food is, is nowhere near the experience that was uh, th that people went through in the 1940s. Um, and you all going through school in the 1940s, you already said, you know, that you didn't have, um, uh, that the, the, the food, normal foods were just not available. All sorts of odd things had to happen. All, I know I've been to, uh, told about um, working on the allotments, going down to work on the various fields. Um, somebody sent a reminiscence about um, working on farms down towards Lechlade. Uh, we have uh, Tony Money's wonderful uh, booklet about um, the Upper Thames guard line with, uh, with the Corps out there with the Home Guard guarding the Thames against invasion, which I think is a wonderful image of, of all of you guys standing there ready to tackle uh, any, any German advance that reached the Upper Thames. Uh, and the prisoner of war letters, I think, are one of the great moments for the Radleyan Society. This, of course, is the work of Vivian Hope, who I'm sure many of you will remember. And if you were wet bobs, you will particularly remember Vivian Hope. Uh, and he did several great things for the school. In the 1930s, he masterminded uh, fundraising to buy uh, Jesus Avenue and extend our boundary, the boundary of our lands, up to the lodge, because that didn't actually belong to us, um, which was a, a, a great thing. Also to buy um, the land around Peachcroft Farm, 
which in the 1970s, of course, was realized for building and is, is the foundation of any prosperity that we have at the moment. Uh, so he did a, a great deal for the college, which he should be remembered for. But I think this, this act of personally writing to every single prisoner of war, organizing parcels of books and cigarettes. And I must admit that um, when I sent this out to the boys the other day, I, it, it included not just the, um, the postcard back from um, a Stalag in Germany, but also the message from the prisoner of war um, fund acknowledging the receipt of three packets of cigarettes. And I heard a couple of boys walking past the uh, past my office sort of saying, did you see that thing she sent out? Three boxes of fags, <laughs> uh, which obviously is not a thing that they would have now. So I do, I do think that this, this collection of um, cards and letters that we have from Vivian Hope, uh, both the ones from the prisoners of war, but also the ones from their parents and their families, are uh, an incredibly moving legacy that we have here. Uh, and that again, must have been something that you were all aware of as, um, as boys in the school, was uh, people who had gone away, you know, your slightly older contemporaries who had left and, and gone to war. What I did notice though, working through one of the, um, the photograph albums, was that when I worked through a, an album of people from who were here just before World War I or into 1914, 1915, 1916. Photograph after photograph after photograph includes members of teams who did not survive the First World War. Whereas looking at the, 19, uh, the 1940s, from 1943 onwards, I was finding team after team who did survive because uh, obviously it was just less relentless towards the end of the war. So it was really quite interesting to see the difference in experience coming through simply by, um, by what was happening to young men at the time. Again, does anybody want to come back at me on this? Does anybody recall this? Michael, um, if you would like to go. I seem to remember that on our war memorial, it was exactly the same number. And I mm. seem to remember the figure of 272, I might be quite wrong on this, of the, those who died from the First and the Second World Wars. Yes, yes it is, but proportionately a much, uh, a considerably larger school. Oh, I suppose that's right. <laughs> I don't know, my yes. father was badly wounded in the First World War from Radley. He was shot through the neck in 1915, oh. but survived, obviously. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. the survivors are, are very difficult. Uh, it's the, um, with Radley War Memorial, of course, it's the RAF, which I, I think nearly a third of those who fell were in, in the RAF, uh, which, was, which was in part the difference. It's, it's not the trenches now, it's actually... What, the Royal mm. Flag? Oh, oh. Uh, no, in World War II, the, the actually the, the, the Royal Air Force. Um, and of course, one of the great tragedies of that time was the uh, suicide of Walter Smale in H Social, which was believed to be in part the death of his mother, which left him bereft, but also he lost H Social to Eastbourne because they were moved into the social itself. And then very many of the uh, of the men from H went into the RAF and fell. So we have these very sad moments as, as, as well as, as some of the fun ones. Again, does anybody want to come back at me on that? Was anybody in H Social? Sorry to interrupt I, yeah. again. Sorry to interrupt again. But actually talking of people going away to war, I was at Radley in 1945, and the thing I particularly remember is the younger masters coming back from the war, mm. been away throughout the war. Thank you. Yes, the, um, the, the teachers are quite interesting. Uh, because, of course, it was actually during this period that we had the first two uh, women teachers who were, who were actually teaching uh, one I think modern languages and the other biology or chemistry and 
it's very interesting that um, A.K. Boyd, when he drew up his history in 1947, said, oh, well, they were here, but not for long. And when they listed the, uh, uh, the list of uh, dons in the, in the school register, again, he went through and any don who'd been here for less than about 18 months, he expunged from the register, so they weren't there. So the two women who were here are not actually recorded as having taught at Radley. Uh, and I have had one or two reminiscences from people where they're telling me that these are, uh, they were fairly fearsome, uh, which she would be. Uh, I know one had been, uh, was actually a, um, she was a member of the uh, Royal Chemical Society. She knew exactly what she was talking about. She was teaching science. She'd come from, I think, Wickham Abbey, but I think she had a fairly tough time while she was here. So again, does anybody remember being taught by women at school? Okay. Just that narrow... Peter? Can you unmute yourself, Peter? Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Quick comment on uh, Tubby Hope, as he was known. Tubby Hope, the best mm. social tutor, without any doubt, in my time at Radley. And incidentally, David Craig, who I'd like to greet, known to us as Paddy Craig, I'd like to greet him and congratulate him on being the most famous living old Radleyan uh, amongst my contemporaries. Paddy was head of Hope's social. He went on to become head of the school. He was captain of Rugger. He was captain of boats. Everything he did in life was fantastic. And he ended up as air chief marshal and chief of the defense staff. Paddy, I salute you. Peter, thank you very much for that thoroughly undeserved series of remarks. But uh, certainly Tubby Hope was the very best of tutors. He certainly looked after me very well. I think other Peter would like to speak. Uh, you might have to unmute yourself. Yes, I want to go back first of all to the, the rugger match because mm -hmm. I remember as a very junior um, old Red, Red Leon on the being on the touchline and being absolutely shattered by East, Eastbourne, or as we called them, the bogs at those days, uh, having beaten us. If, whether it was 1944 or 43, I don't know, but I think it was the last match before Eastbourne returned back to their home at Eastbourne. Uh, it, it, the, the try was, we went, before then, we went out as horrible little old Red Leans, um, saying we were going to smash the bogs, put them in their place and all the rest of it. But to our horror, it was very much at the last minute, if I remember correctly, one of their wings got over and we were beaten. And we were absolutely shattered that we were, we were beaten. A years later, I went down to Eastbourne and some conference, and I met, uh, I, think he, I think his name was Rod. Uh, he, was, he was the Eastbourne Don, who was in charge of the rugby at um, Eastbourne at the time, Radley at the time. Uh, he, he remembers this match. He described it and he said, that match actually saved Eastbourne College from extinction. He said, when we won that match, we Dons and other Eastbourne supporters came off the field in tears because we knew how much it meant to our morale. We were able to, uh, to hold our heads up proudly once again because we'd beaten Radley. And that, that match was so important to Eastbourne. And years later, I was talking to John Newty, who was, of course, head, head of, uh, headmaster of Eastbourne at the time, who was a great friend of my father's and friend of the family as well. And he backed this up. And he said that match was the most important thing that ever happened to Eastbourne College in its Bradley days. That's excellent. That again is something which is uh, a, a piece of new information that we haven't had before.
something else that I, I, I picked out to think about was um, we've talked about Vivian Hope writing to the prisoners of war. Uh, what we also have in the archive is a wonderful collection of, of all the letters that were written to Charles Rinch. Um, obviously a lot of the time during the war he was actually head of Raines Park School but he had been at uh, Radley uh, and he came back to Radley uh, after the war and this is an amazing collection. We, we, I've, I've got things written, written in sort of purple crayon on the back of a scrap of paper, which is somebody who's just saying, I'm in a tank turret moving across Europe. But part of uh, Rinch's uh, legacy for us, of course, is the things like the Don's plays and the whole of the drama. And I notice how very often uh, something about a Don's play will be what people reminisce about. The number of times um, an old Radleyan will, will sit and, and, and just sort of sing one of the songs. You can't have heard them more than once or twice, but they made such an impact. I know I, I had uh, Michael Bawtry, who obviously is from the 1950s rather than 1940s, um, stood uh, in cover passage once and, and just did the entire song and dance routine for me uh, from a Don's play. So this is Centenary Moonshine. Obviously we had things like It's That Don Again and various other things, but they do seem to have had a massive impact. And the relationship between pupils and teachers uh, must have been really quite special that they felt they could put these plays on uh, writing for you, Seti Borny composing the music, which I do have as well, uh, and, and just stand there on stage in front of the entire school and perform. Um, but, but the school also to, to respond to that and to, to regard the whole lot with such affection. Um, and my personal feeling is that, is that it is these Don's plays, which of course feed into uh, some of the things like the creativity of Peter Cook, which is linked to the kind of stuff that they were doing. But obviously what they're doing also is, is related to some of the radio stuff. So it's that Don again, is like Itmar and so on. So again, memories, memories of the Dons, the particular Dons and the Dons plays. What, what can anybody come back to me on that? Nobody's planning to sing. Well, where we will go then, remembering that, is that if we go back to this, this is Radley Retrospect. Uh, this is very, um, it's very grainy, uh, because I say this was the dentist from Abingdon filming. Uh, it's about four minutes long. It gets darker and darker because he's just at the back of the crowd as an evening performance goes on. And a lot of this you will remember. And some of this is the kind of thing we might well now think twice about. But I'll just move us on to it.
So we've had all sorts of uh, images there. I'm going to go back to um, back to listen to some more of the retrospect. hopefully let's start I think that is a place where I would want to stop and open this up to discussion and memories and anything else. And uh, I really want to thank all those who participated. I hope that it has been um, interesting, parts of it moving, parts of it fun. But thank you very much for joining us. So please come back to us now with questions and chat and anything else. Peter. Sorry, Caroline? Me again, me again sir. You prompted me to remember one of the splendid shows put on during the Don's plays. Mm. They were hilarious. Uh, they were all scripted by either Plugs Rawlins or Charlie Rinch. Mm. Very witty, wonderful skits. And the one which I remember forever is that they used to dress up as women or girls and Tiny Southern who was a huge man, he was about six foot three and very heavy, dressed as a girl, dancing on the stage and <laughs> singing that wonderful song, Why Am I Always a Bridesmaid, Never the Blushing Bride, Ding Dong, Wedding Bells Always Ring for Other Girls. And I remember Tiny Southern singing that and it brought the house down. It was such fun. <laughs> Michael? Michael? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Claire, for what you've done. Um, as a matter of interest, and very briefly, before we started, I listed 15 points that were my recollections of Radley. We've so far only covered five of them. Right. Can I quickly run through without commenting on the other ones? Yes, certainly. Um, one of the things I'm sad to say I've got written down is homosexuality was a big thing in the school in those days, uh, both amongst the boys and from certain dons. Um, next, no parental visitors or half-term visits, um, a daily social PT, wearing gowns, poor heating, so it's jolly cold. Um, I went on the 1948 British Public Schools Explorer and Society's Expedition to Canada, which was, of course, a marvellous break from wartime, or hitherto wartime England. Um, chapel services played a big part in our lives, including the warden's ordination. Um, some boys who'd been in India and other places during the war came back uh, to the school um, in the 40s. In fact, a contemporary of mine, Adeson's, had come from India. Um, and then there were two particular ORs who subsequently, I've not been at school with, although I overlap with one of them, 
had a big effect on my life. Dick Worsley, General Sir Richard Worsley, who got me into the Rifle Brigade, and then Rick Wheeler Bennett, who was chairman of Murray Curie Cancer Care for many years when I was chief executive. So those are my other recollections. Thank you. Right. Michael, would you like to uh, pop those into uh, on an email for us and send them across so we can add them? Yes. Say yes again. Yes, yes, I will, of course. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think um, uh, Peter, I oh, think, is waving. Okay. Peter, over to you. Just one or two things I've noted down. I remember the Pe Penny Gubbins, uh, who didn't mention the fact that I think he was head of boxing. Mm -hmm. A very small uh, junior boy. We all had to box, not because we wanted to, because we hated it, uh, but we got a point for our social. And so we had to go and box. And I'm sure he was behind that. The other thing that, that I remember clearly is we were talking about the Dons who taught us during the war. Um, we met Char Charlie Rinch, who was so extraordinary man to hear talking. I, he, he, I think he was do, doing probably Hamlet for me on, on higher cert. And he was meant to be preparing us for exam higher cert exams. But he never got further than the first opening, peep, uh, opening speech of it, because he went off on tangents. Anyway, his words were worth a giddy a minute. And then there was S.P.B. Mace, who uh, the name of some people will remember. The only thing I remember about him was the fact that he was fascinated to hear him talking and he had numerous waistcoats, coloured waistcoats that he wore when he taught. And he was one of the great characters that we had in those days. Um, the other thing that I wonder what was mentioned was the last end of night oval team. In Morgan's social, we were there. The last thing we had before we bed, bed was a was a was a mug of Ovaltine. That <laughs> clears my memory of that. I wonder whether other socials had Ovaltine last thing at night. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I can see see you all sitting around with a with a mug of Ovaltine, possibly singing the Ovaltine song. Wasn't that? Anybody else? Anything else they would like to add? If if you have notes or if this has jogged memories, please just just pop them on an email and send them across to us. I'm going to hand back to Caroline now. And, um, Thank Caroline? you, Claire. Thank you. So, um, well, thank you, Claire. I have to say that was incredibly interesting. I really enjoyed hearing about all that. And I particularly enjoyed hearing all of your stories as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Claire, we'll stick around for a little bit longer after the end of this call, if anybody wants to just have another, continue their chat with her. Before you go, I would briefly like to tell you about a book that Claire is developing for our 175th anniversary celebration. She is the author. Um, the celebration of our 175th anniversary, as I'm sure you all know, will be in 2022. The book is called Untold Stories, and it will be stories from people like you, and explores the history of Radley through Sewell's and Singleton's original founding principles. We're going to advertise this in December's upcoming Old Radleyan, so do look out for Leaflet, and that'll tell you more about it and how to order it. Um, all that remains to say after that is thank you everyone for attending. We hope that you found today both useful and interesting. Our next event is actually on Friday the 20th of November and is about Radley in the 1950s, which you're all welcome to join us at again. So thank you very much. Those who wish to leave, please do so. And anyone who wishes to stay on, please do so as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Caroline. Caroline, as I'm leaving, thank you and Claire very much indeed. It's been fascinating and I'm looking forward to thinking about other things which I might tell you and will let you know about in due course. And hello everybody that remembers me and or tries to remember me. Bye bye. Thank you, David. It's lovely bye. to see you. Thank you. Thank you, David. <coughs> Go. Robbie? Robbie, are you unmuting?
I can unmute. Yes. Am I now unmuted? Yes. Well, I'm just a script compared with you lot. I only joined in 48, so I'm very junior, but nevertheless, quite redu uh, un un unrepentant. It, I've loved that, and thank you so much for all of you for contributing. Much appreciated. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it too. I was an exchange student in 46, 47. So I got to meet Princess Elizabeth. I remember singing For All the Saints. We rehearsed that in chapel with the presenter. I can remember that. There are a lot of memories of my time at Bradley that year. Really good to have you joining us from America. That was a lovely thing. Well, I'm still, in, I'm still in my night clothes because it's early here. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie, did you put your hand up again? Oh, okay. Everyone, if you wanted to chat, do feel free to come off mute and just chat to Claire. That's fine. Um, there's no more rules. <laughs> Okay, Michael, Peter. Yes, who Just wants? It's okay, Michael. Oh, we've got everybody um, talking at once. Peter, if you stay on mute and Michael, you speak. Michael, speak. Okay, just to say to you and to Claire, thank you both very much for doing this. Well done. Um, it's been great fun, and I will now mail, email to you my, my other list of points. Mm -hmm. All the best, and good luck to everybody. Thank and you. good to hear all those memories. It's rather fascinating to hear all those things that went on. Thank did, you. Did you, know, did you know a lot of them, Penelope? I, I've heard quite a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> but interesting to see the film of Princess Elizabeth, and how interesting that how her voice has changed. Yes. It's very marked the way she spoke when she was a 19 year old to how she speaks now. Yes. And to spend 18 and eightpence on chocolates for her must have been phenomenal. <laughs> well, well, a big deal doing away with yeah. the rations. But actually, I was in the Royal Guard of Honour on that day. And I don't remember there being so many of us. I, I just felt it was me and a few others in this very <laughs> privileged position. <laughs> Good. Okay, bye and thanks so much. Bye bye, thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye bye, thank bye -bye. you. Peter, did you want to say something? Well, I would, but that was such a beautiful closing statement by Ronnie that I won't spoil the program. Thank <laughs> you very much for such an enjoyable hour. Thank you, thank you for contributing so thank well. You. Thank you. Did anybody else want to say anything before we end the meeting? No? Oh, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very, very much. It's lovely to see you all. Do join us next week if you fancy some more of the same. Lovely. Thank you.